Okay, well, it's 12.30. Once again, we are having a lecture on climate change here in Issues in Environmental Science, OCE 4017 and OCE 5018. This is the final lecture that I will present. The, the future classes will be presented by students. So today I'm going to be reviewing briefly the material that I presented on Tuesday, just to clarify some of the points that I made and hopefully put it into a clear concept. Uh, and then I'll be talking about the ways in which carbon dioxide controls the uh, present day greenhouse effect and is responsible for uh, atmospheric forcing of global warming. So before I do that, a little brief housekeeping. I just sent out an announcement to clarify what is coming. So we're gonna have four days of presentation. Um, so we'll meet again to, uh, next week on Tuesday. Um, and everybody's expected to attend these lectures. Um, because of the way that the time slots have become compressed, we're going to allow 15 minutes, not 20 minutes for each presentation. So there'll be four presentations per day. And that should leave uh, sufficient time between the presentations so that students can ask questions and I can clarify some of the points that are brought up. So Carrie has put up a uh, list of sign-up slots on the calendar, and each team should sign up for one of the slots. Now, the final day of presentations will actually be during exam week on the 8th. Um, and I understand that there may be some conflicts. I don't think there are, but there may be some conflicts. Um, but the reason for this, for having uh, presentations on the final day, is that several teams have been impacted by COVID-19, where one or more team members uh, have been affected with uh, symptoms that prevent them from uh, fully participating in preparations. So this will allow those teams a little bit more time to get themselves organized. Um, so the uh, there'll be four presentations per day. And each team uh, in this part of your presentation must compose five multiple choice or true false questions based on the material that you present in your lecture, in your presentation. And I suggest that you show these five questions without the answers uh, as a slide in your presentation. Now, some housekeeping notes about the presentations. Because we have uh, four presentations per day, and each one is going to be limited to 15 minutes. I'm going to be very strict about timekeeping. And I also ask that um, you really get yourselves ready. Each team gets yourselves ready for the presentation uh, to come. And the best mode will probably be for the one of the team member with the most reliable uh, internet connection to share his or her screen and then go through the slides. Um, and, but uh, it is a good idea, and a lot of the teams will want to do this, to have different members of the team present different portions of the, the overall presentation. And what I ask is that you be practiced in this, that, you, that there be a smooth handoff, that um, when one presentation finishes and we were done with the questions, that the next presentation is ready to go, and the um, uh, person who was sharing her his or her screen have the presentation already lined up on uh, your computer and so that you're ready right away to share your screen without having to open or search through internets or emails or anything like that because um, that'll save a lot of time it'll make everything uh, cleaner for the audience okay uh, and then uh, regarding the final there'll be a as we did before there'll be a take-home portion and a, a quiz portion, multiple choice, true, false question uh, portion. The take home exam will be distributed on the 4th of December and it'll be due at midnight on the 9th. Uh, and 
you should expect uh, questions in the take home portion about the material that I have presented in my lectures, uh, not just uh, today and Tuesday, but in uh, the recent lectures since the midterm. So I've done a lot of lecturing and that material um, will be covered in the uh, take home portion of the exam. There will also be a multiple choice true false uh, section. This will not, there will not be essay questions or anything like that. This will just be um, multiple choice quizzes that you'll complete and that will be um, administered uh, 2 to 5 p.m. Actually, I'm sorry, it's 3 to 5 p.m. on the 10th. That's the regularly scheduled day for, for our final. And um, so the material in there will um, be heavily weighted towards the, the questions that the different teams put forward and then uh, any additional questions from the reading quizzes um, that you've already taken. Uh, okay, so any questions before I get started on my lecture about uh, these topics? Is, um, is the take home, so you said the take home exam is going to be more based on um, lecture material. Is the multiple choice also going to be um, more lecture material? Uh, the multiple choice and true false will be uh, lecture material, but it'll be uh, presentation material. So uh, probably you know, at least 40 or 50 percent of the exam will be the questions that each of the team um, uh, compose uh, to cover the material that they're presenting in their uh, presentation. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yep. Thank you. OK, so um, and, and, you know, each team, of course, will know the answers to their the questions that they have composed. So that'll give you a, you know, put a little cushion into the into the material required there. So um, the, the final exam, I know I have to give a final and uh, this final will cover that. Um, so, and, and you know, having taken the midterm, this will not be that different uh, from the midterm, either in um, length or challenge or difficulty of the multiple choice true false questions. Any yeah, I have a question. Go um, ahead. What, what actual day is our, do we turn our presentation in like, on a specific date, or is it being turned in like while we're? Uh, yeah, let's make a, that's a good good point. Let's make the uh, take home portion of the uh, presentation report due uh, on the the third of um, uh, December. Okay. So our okay. So our um, our report that goes with our presentation and powerpoints those are all due on the the fourth. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? All right, great. Yes, go ahead. Uh, just to get a little clarification. So on the fourth, we have our presentation and our paper, our research paper all due on the fourth, correct? Uh, yes. Your okay, research thank report. you. Yeah. And that way you're done with the reporting and the presentation and all that. And then you can, you know, maybe take a little a day off and then get started on the on the take home exam. And the take home exam will be thought questions and diagram questions, and and you you'll have plenty of time to complete that. So the, the point is not to, you know, make this a time management challenge, but to you know give you an opportunity to to you know reflect on the thought questions and do the research and answer things in a in a complete way. And I expect everybody to do pretty well in this. Okay, anything else? All right, well, let me cover this, this material here. So you'll recall that um, on Tuesday's lecture, I talked about climate change and looked at this concept of climate cycles. And so that's one thing that you hear a lot when the discussion of, of what climate change is and how severe it is and how we should understand that is that people talk about climate change cycles. And an argument that uh, people who are skeptical about the current trends of global warming and, and uh, climate change, one thing that I've heard people say, including President Trump, is that this is a cycle and that we're currently um, in a cycle. And if we just wait, it will get cooler again um, or that we'll switch back to some other. Now, there are a lot of truth in this concept that there's a, a cycle 
Um, um, but I think we need to recognize that these cycles uh, are not strictly periodic, that the, you know, that the length of the cycles, the period of the cycles uh, is changing. And that also we get very different pictures depending on what sort of time scale we use to evaluate the cycles. This is something I discussed uh, on Tuesday, but let me just review this in a, in a whole series here. So if we take the longest view of uh, climate change and look over the entire Phanerozoic, roughly 600 million years, actually 542 million years uh, is, is uh, specified as the beginning of the, um, uh, the Phanerozoic period. The Phanerozoic period is characterized by the development, the evolution, the ramifications of uh, multicellular organisms. So prior to uh, 550 million years ago, um, all of the life on earth was microbial life. And then starting uh, at roughly 600 million years ago, um, multicellular life forms began to evolve. And with this evolution, there was an explosion of diversity and change. Um, this uh, produced you know, vast numbers of uh, species uh, and, um, in, in, and the presence of these organisms radically altered um, the, the geology, the climate, the characteristics uh, of Earth, not just as a living planet. Okay, so if we look over this 540 million years, uh, and you know, roughly here is the temperature, the short-term average temperature and the long-term average temperature. Um, long-term and short-term are relative here to the entire time scale. Uh, so you can see that if you look at this, that there have been some major swings on you know, multi-million year time scales uh, in the, uh, the Earth's climate. And um, you know, there have been periods when the Earth was much, much warmer than it is at present, and there have been periods when it was much, much colder than it is at present. And, you know, in these warm times, um, you know, the, the, the Earth was entirely ice-free. Uh, there are different times when there were ferns and crocodiles and tropical uh, uh, fauna at the uh, both the North and the South Pole. Um, so there have been periods that are very warm and we wouldn't have you know, recognized the climate zones on, on Earth in those days at all. There have also been periods, uh, cold periods, when the Earth is essentially frozen solid, well, frozen solid, but has been co was covered with you know, extensive layers of ice. Um, there's debate about whether the Earth entirely froze over or whether they were patches of uh, the land and the ocean that were ice free. But in any event, for periods of, of tens of millions of years, um, we were in what was called the snowball Earth period. And so glacial periods in the Ordovician Silurian, um, the Cambrian uh, Permian, and the Jurassic Cretaceous times, they were very cold periods. And it's noteworthy that, you know, starting about 50 million years ago, uh, we entered into one of these cold periods and um, the earth was various episodes within this cold period covered with ice. And um, that, you know, so that the ice sheets would advance and retreat. And, uh, but, you know, uh, compared to the entire uh, 500 million year period, this is uh, we are living through or we are coming to the end of um, what would be considered a cold period. How do we know this? Well, this is uh, the various proxies that we use for making these determinations, which I discussed uh, Tuesday and, and will not reiterate today. So that was a 600 million year time scale. If we look at a 60 million year time scale. So this period right in here at the extreme uh, right side of this graph, uh, if we look at that again now, um, in this case, we're going from you know, uh, 60 million years. So these are essentially negative numbers compared with the current time. So um, uh, about uh, 60 million years ago, there was a, a warm period uh, reaching its peak in the Eocene approximately 50 million years ago. And then thereafter, the Earth began to cool um, relatively rapidly. Uh, various reasons for this cooling. Uh, one of the major reasons for the cooling was the uh, formation of the uh, Himalayan uh, mountain range at this time, which uh, you know, caused uh, changes in Earth's atmosphere and the absorption of CO2, uh, which resulted in um, 
uh, decrease in temperature. Antarctica became glaciated about 30 million years ago. Um, it's not clear if it's warmed or cooled, but in any event, um, by uh, 15 million years ago, the Antarctic was completely glaciated and has remained glaciated ever since. Uh, stepping forward, um, you know, uh, to the more recent time, the Miocene, the Pliocene, and Pleistocene, um, you know, we can see that, uh, that uh, you know, there were extensive ice sheets both in Antarctica and in the Northern Hemisphere. So that's a 60 million year record. And you can see there's this trend in cooling, but within this trend, there are, you know, rapid oscillations in, in, um, in compared to the overall time scale uh, in global temperatures. We'll talk about what causes those more rapid isolations in a second. But so this is the, the long-term record of over 60 million years. If we look at a 1 million year time scale, and here we are uh, in the realm within which um, we can use ice cores as a more precise uh, proxy for global temperatures. Uh, so we've got uh, 5 million years of uh, climate change from sediment cores. And then over the last uh, million years or so, we start being able to use um, ice cores as records. And again, you can see that there's an overall downward trend in temperature. And, um, the, um, you know, and within these trends, there are oscillations, excursions up and down um, you know, from the average temperature. Okay. And so this is this zero here represents the average temperature over this entire period. And then you can see that there have been um, you know, very rapid changes. Now, um, note that uh, in this uh, cycle here, you see a 41,000 uh, kilo year, 41,000 year cycle, and a roughly 100,000 year cycle. These cycles refer to Milankovitch forcing. Milankovitch forcing as we discussed, uh, and I'll uh, illustrate this with a slide a little bit further on, these are cycles in Earth temperature that are caused by variations in Earth's orbit around the sun um, due to the influence of the uh, massive planets, the Neptune, Jupiter, uh, Saturn, upon the Earth's orbit, upon various features of the Earth's orbit. And again, you can see that there are these oscillations um, but the noteworthy thing is that, um, you know, roughly uh, three million years ago to roughly a million years ago, the dominant uh, cycle length was 41,000 years. And then after that, we switched into a period where there was a roughly 100,000 year uh, cycle. Um, so uh, a 41,000 year and 100,000 year cycle. And the, the reason for this shift is, uh, is a matter of uh, scientific research and debate. Um, but for our purposes, let's just uh, recognize that this is what occurred and that for the last million years, more or less, uh, we have been in a period when the variations in climate uh, followed a period, a cycle, just as people say, but that cycle has a period length of about 100,000 years. Okay, so over this 100,000 year period, now we're looking at records from, from the um, ice cores, and so we're going back uh, about 375, 400,000 years. Most of these records, these records will be a combination of uh, ice cores taken in the Antarctic, called the Vostok cores, and ice cores taken from the Greenland ice sheet called the Grisp cores. And these uh, tell us, these show us, you know, some of this, this cycling. So you can see that, this, that these peaks of about 100,000 years uh, correspond to warming and cooling events. Okay, so the, the x-axis has swapped here. And so this is the present. And then as we go further out on the x-axis, we get deeper and deeper into time. And so if we understand this cycling, what we see here is that, that um, you know, these 100,000 year uh, cycles are characterized by a rapid run-up in temperature followed by a slow decline. And this run-up in temperature uh, corresponds to a run-up in uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide. And so the 
temperature and carbon dioxide increase rapidly together and then gradually subside over time. So rapid um, warming followed by much slower cooling. It's been the 100,000 year cycle. And we can see that there are roughly uh, four of these um, events within the um, uh, last 400,000 years. So that confirms or is, is evidence uh, consistent with this 100,000 year domination. Okay, well, let's step to a shorter time frame. Here we are now looking at the GISP uh, ice cores the last 10,000 years. And we can see that even within this last 10,000 year period, there are um, uh, you know, uh, oscillations in, in, in temperature. Again, you gotta watch out because this, this uh, uh, x-axis time scale has flipped around again. But once again, we can see that there are these excursions up and down. And um, these, uh, uh, the period length in here is about 1,505 years. Uh, so it's a pretty reliable clock over the last 100,000 years or so, last 10,000 years or so, um, and, you know, with warming spikes followed by cooling spikes. And some of these warming spikes, um, you know, uh, uh, coincide with the beginnings of historical records. So we actually have um, records, written records, written observations, and other uh, forms of human um, uh, proxies that allow us to uh, resolve these, these characteristics with um, pretty good precision. And you can see that the, during the Roman period, there was a, a long period of warming, um, and then there was a cool period, uh, you know, uh, in this. Uh, Time frame here. There was what's called the medieval warm period, which you, you may have heard of. And then there was the little ice age, a uh, long period of cooling that started in about um, uh, early 17, six, late 1600s, early 1700s, and continued right the way through um, the beginning of the 19th century. So America um, was, was you know, colonized and the United States was founded during a time when the temperatures across most of the North American continent were considerably colder uh, than they are now. Um, starting about a hundred years or so, the temperature began increasing. Now this green line here, this green line is the um, um, Milankovitch 100,000 year cycle that we're, you know, that's stretched out over this period. And so, um, you know, what you can see is that the, that the Milankovitch forcing reached its peak, um, you know, about five, 6,000 years ago and has been declining. So according to the Milankovitch cycle and according to the experience of the last um, a million years or so, uh, we should be in a period of uh, relative cooling uh, as, the, as uh, predicted by Milankovitch cycle. All right, well, let's go into uh, climate proxies and human impact. So this is uh, looking at, uh, this is a, article by uh, Bunkin and others uh, from the magazine Science, uh, published in 2011. And what these authors did was that they used um, wood from wooden structures recovered from archeological uh, digs and also from uh, contemporary structures, buildings that stand to this day. And they were able to take from these um, uh, uh, wooden structures, uh, uh, samples that could be analyzed and using tree rings, a process called dendrology. And these dendrology um, uh, records give us a, you know, a really precise annual record of uh, warming and cooling. And so um, this is showing fellings here, this is showing the uh, removal of trees. Um, uh, this is uh, population in millions. And so we can see that there was a, a long period of, uh, of um, uh, time when there were um, declines in population. So the, the Great Famine and the Black Death uh, produced a, a decrease in human population. Um, the migration period in here also produced a uh, protracted period in, during which human population uh, did not grow, um, was stable or even declining. And uh, you know, there are a variety of reasons for that. Obviously, there was a, a, a pathogen here that caused this, um, and there were wars and other factors. But these wars and uh, periods also correspond to times of um, uh, relative cooling. And so this migration period was a time when the, not only was the weather 
cold, but the uh, seasonal variability in uh, uh, precipitation and rainfall, uh, the, the grow, uh, growing cycle for, for agricultural uh, crops, you know, became much more unstable and much less reliable during this migration period. And so this time, you know, after around the fall of the Roman Empire uh, was also corresponded to a time of um, you know, climate instability. Okay. And then also likewise, during the uh, Great Famine and the Black Death, there were periods of relative cooling. Um, and you know, there's a lot, a lot of speculation that, um, you know, that uh, these periods uh, uh, corresponded, you know, that the uh, population effects, impacts um, pr pr promoted um, you know, human response. And so, for example, we can see here in the mid 1800s um, that there were repeated crop failures in Europe, and you know, the most famous of which would have been the, um, the uh, potato blight in, uh, in Ireland, you know, which had various causes, but also coincided with a you know, period of cold weather. And so, uh, across this period, we can see that climate variability. Uh, has had, um, you know, has, has, climate has varied. Uh, the variability uh, has had some cyclical characteristics, um, but that these, that the, the factors driving these, uh, this, this cyclicity and the uh, period length of these cycles uh, is, is by no means constant and has been changing uh, over time. Okay, um, so what causes that? We talked about um, uh, Milankovitch cycles, and I encouraged you uh, to learn the uh, ETP um, uh, uh, memory device for trying to understand that. So the eccentricity cycle is 110,000 years. That's the 100,000 year record that you saw earlier on. And that is that describes the variations in the um, elongation of Earth's elliptical orbit around the sun. So during cold periods, um, the relative cold periods in these Milankovitch cycles, the Earth at its um, uh, perigee would have been farther uh, from the sun than um, uh, uh, the other side of the cycle. And so obviously with less insulation, less in solar energy reaching the planet, we could expect um, a relative cold period. Uh, so that's the 100,000 year cycle. Um, and that became the dominant driving uh, factor uh, roughly a million years ago. So for the past million years or so, we've been in, in this uh, eccentricity or oblique the T cycle. Prior to that, we were in this uh, cycle where um, the variations in Earth's tilt, uh, the tilt of Earth's axis drove climate cycles uh, with a period of about 40,000 years. So there was a shift. Um, roughly uh, a million years ago. Prior to that, uh, there had been you know, several million years when the tilt cycle was predominant, and then uh, more recently, this uh, obliquity or eccentricity cycle became the dominant uh, forcing factor. So that's the Milankovitch cycles. So according to the Milankovitch cycles, you know, if you look here in the, um, so here's the uh, obliquity record. Um, and here is the uh, eccentricity. So here they are broken down. So here's just the eccentricity variation, eccentricity or obliquity, the, the elongation of the elliptical orbit around the sun. And you know, if we look at the present time, that should be decreasing. The um, uh, tilt uh, period is also uh, driving us towards uh, colder conditions, and so is the pre precession. So all of the Milankovitch cycles, even though tilt has been predominant, are all tending to produce colder conditions if the cycles um, that we're observing now are consistent with what has occurred in the past. But that is not what we're seeing. Temperature is actually increasing. And so if we look particularly over the last hundred years, so we've been stepping through here with, you know, um, uh, this is a sort of a decadal scale in terms of temperature. And um, you can see that, um, that the, uh, in this case, the, you know, this is the tilt cycle. Um, the, and you can see that we should be, um, uh, this is where we are right now. And so everything is tending, trending downward. And so, where we are now should actually be 
in a cold period. Um, so we should be like in the Little Ice Age or something like that if we were uh, following the same regime that has uh, characterized Earth's climate uh, in the uh, more, more distant past. Instead, what we see is that starting in about 1950, and certainly an accelerating trend uh, in the late 1970s and 1980s, we're getting warmer and warmer periods. And so this, um, uh, this uh, graph is presenting the average temperature over the last 100 years or so, more than 100 years. Um, and these uh, blue or red um, uh, bars show excursions uh, either toward the cold or toward the warm. And uh, in the last uh, uh, recent years, we've gotten warmer and warmer. So we're departing, uh, we have departed from the climate cycle um, and the climate cycle predictivity uh, prediction uh, characteristics that have, um, you know, uh, been, uh, that we would have predicted from looking into the past. What's going on? Uh, why is this happening? Well, I think you know the answer to that, but let's dive into the answer and try to understand it more clearly. Okay. So what we are experiencing now, according to scientific theory, is uh, the uh, impact of radiative forcing by greenhouse gases. And you've heard about the greenhouse effect, but let's try to understand the greenhouse effect in, you know, with a little bit more quantitative detail. Okay, so we are all of the energy, most of the energy that drives our cycles comes from the sun. And most of the energy coming from the sun arrives in the uh, uh, wavelength uh, range of visible light between about um, uh, uh, 400 nanometer and 700 nanometer in length. So um, that is the uh, light range that we can see with our eyes and uh, our eyes have evolved to make maximum use of the incoming uh, radiation. We, okay, so this is the, the range of incoming light. Most of the, you know, the energy coming from the sun arrives at earth in the form of visible light. So here's a diagram uh, showing the uh, range of visible light. And here you can see that it's between four and seven uh, nanometers in uh, 700 nanometers in, um, uh, in wavelength. And so that visible light arrives in the sun, from the sun, and uh, when it comes into the, you know, enters into the Earth's atmosphere, that light, that energy performs work. Um, and what is that work? Well, that work is the all of the things that happen with our climate and our weather, the uh, winds, the currents, the uh, precipitation, all of those factors are driven by um, uh, changes in um, uh, you know, by the energy uh, arriving from the sun. Well, 100% of the energy that arrives from the sun is eventually radiated back from Earth out into space. But in the process of doing that work, there is a, um, law, you know, a second law of thermodynamics effect where this visible light, um, you know, which is uh, useful uh, energy, uh, performs work and becomes less useful uh, when it's re-radiated back out into space. What does less useful mean? That means that it uh, it's you know, literally its uh, wavelength changes from this uh, 400 to 700 nanometer range to a range of about 800 to 1200 nanometers. Okay, and so this um, is the characteristic of the energy that's re-radiated from Earth back out into space. Is 100% uh, of the same amount of energy that's arriving at the Earth is being re-radiated, but that. And that energy has been transformed as a well, function of the work that it that it you know, that it did within the Earth system, and into this uh, less useful, longer wavelength material. Okay, so um, if the energy has to be radiated back out into space uh, after performing a certain amount of work, this uh, wavelength range of eight to to um, 12 uh, nan uh, 1200 uh, nanometers, uh, 8 to 12 nanometers, is um, uh, pretty critical. And in fact, this range is known as the atmospheric window. So that's the, um, the, uh, 
spectrum space within which uh, energy has to, to radiate back out into space. Okay, so anything that would stop this uh, energy from getting back out into, into space would tend like a lid on a pot to increase the temperature and to force that, and that uh, light energy to do more work, to warm up the planet far further. Okay. So what, is, what things are affecting this um, uh, performance in this range? Well, what you're seeing here is um, you know, the absorption on this scale. So, uh, you know, for uh, energy in the, uh, you know, in the very high frequency wavelength, uh, oxygen and um, uh, ozone are very effective, uh, effective absorbers and blockers of ultraviolet light. And so um, the uh, formation of the ozone layer in the upper atmosphere was one of the things that allowed uh, life to evolve on Earth because that uh, atmospheric property blocked essentially um, uh, uh, light energy in that wavelength range, which is biologically harmful. Okay, so if we get into this, um, you know, this at this uh, uh, range of visible light, there's very little in the atmosphere to block that incoming light. So the atmosphere of Earth is pretty transparent for uh, incoming visible radiation. But then as the radiation degrades, as it you know, assumes longer and longer wavelengths, gases in the atmosphere um, begin to block that uh, outgoing energy. And to do so in within pre predictable uh, wavelength ranges. Okay? And so you can see here that oxygen has a, has a, a, a blocking factor and uh, water vapor, uh, H2O, uh, absorbs in a variety of different spectral ranges. So you can see that H2O, CO2, CO2, H2O um, are blocking uh, outgoing uh, radiation. Okay. Within this atmospheric window, um, ozone blocks outgoing radiation. Uh, and then, um, you know, as you get into longer wavelengths, CO2 um, blocks outgoing radiation. But within this range, uh, from 8 uh, to 12 uh, nanometer, roughly, um, uh, mi uh, mi micrometers, um, the outgoing radiation is, um, can travel through Earth's atmosphere. Okay, so what's happening in this atmospheric window then is very critical. So what, what, what is the process that's going on here? Um, well, um, it's carbon dioxide. So what is carbon dioxide? So carbon dioxide is a well-mixed gas and importantly, it doesn't condense or precipitate out of the atmosphere. So we can think of other things that enter into the atmosphere and, you know, gases like uh, methane or gases like um, water vapor. Well, these are transient gases. They, you know, water, in the case of water vapor, water vapor, you know, uh, evaporates from uh, wet surfaces or from the ocean. The, um, the uh, water vapor enters into the atmosphere, but it doesn't stay long. As you remember when we talked about when we talked about the water cycle, you know, there's a very rapid uh, turnover of water vapor on the in the atmosphere. So clouds are highly active components of the climate system, and they respond very rapidly to changes in temperature um, by evaporating, condensing, and precipitating. Okay. So CO2 doesn't condense or precipitate. So once the CO2 is there, whatever effect it's having is long lasting and dependent on its concentration. So what you have here is the possibility of a feedback loop. We'll get more into that. But um, the uh, important thing to understand is that there, this greenhouse effect isn't something that isn't the hypothesis. It isn't a, you know, a wild idea that has only recently uh, come into vogue. This is something that people have, uh, scientists have predicted for a very long time. And I wanna show you uh, some of the evidence in the past uh, about how people have thought about the greenhouse effect. So we'll start with uh, Fourier in 1824. And um, he made general remarks on the uh, temperature of the terrestrial globe and planetary spaces. And uh, he involved, he says, um, this involves very 
different elements that, which require to be considered in general light. Um, you know, the analytical day details here. The earth is heated by solar rays, the unevil distribution of which causes the diversities of climate. It partakes of common temperature of planetary spaces, being exposed to radiations from innumerable stars which surround the solar system. The earth preserves in its interior part that primitive heat which it had from the first foundations of the planet. So already Fourier in 1824 has got a pretty clear idea of you know, both the, the primitive heat, um, you know, which drives um, uh, plate tectonics and other processes, and then the very predominant role of uh, energy from solar radiation. So already in 1824, uh, you know, scientists were thinking deeply about you know, how energy uh, arrived at the earth and how that energy uh, caused diversities of climate. Well, in 1861, uh, Tyndale performed an experiment and he looked at the absorption and radiation by, of heat by gases and vapors. Uh, and he um, used uh, a carbon dioxide and a you know, very clever, you know, given the technology of the day, absorption uh, device. So he would fill up this um, uh, space with gases of different uh, varieties, and then look at absorption of these gases. And he concluded that uh, carbon dioxide, um, you know, had an effect of um, uh, absorbing heat. Okay, and you know, three percent heat. And so he was measuring this uh, perfectly sensibly. Step forward a few more years uh, to 1896, and Arenas, a Swedish scientist. Um, was the first one who really uh, formulated the idea that um, the presence of carbon dioxide, um, you know, would be uh, dispositive in the um, uh, variations in Earth's climate over time. And uh, so the, he proposes that uh, during the, the Ice Age, um, there would have been less CO2 present. And so, um, And that you know these forces had to be driven by changes in the atmosphere. So what are they talking about? What is absorption? Absorption, um, you know, is the uh, effect that um, gases in the atmosphere have on uh, incoming uh, um, light radiation. In other words, the stream of protons uh, that enter into the atmosphere with the arrival of visible light. And so the, the basic idea is that an incoming uh, um, a proton uh, uh, intersects a molecule of gas in the atmosphere, and it causes it to um, increase its rotation. In other words, the, the impact of the, and they're vague terms, we're using analogies really um, to understand this, but essentially the, um, you know, the presence of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, react with light and that um, uh, the light energy causes faster rotation. In other words, uh, causes a uh, increase in sensible temperature. And that this um, is happening most uh, predominantly in the water vapor window. And so if you look at this water vapor window in detail, you can see that the amount of CO2 is really impinging on this uh, water vapor uh, window. So that if we increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, we're going to be affecting the uh, ability of Earth's atmosphere to allow heat to pass through it and be re-radiated out into space. So increasing CO2 would have the, uh, the effect of um, you know, capping off and raising slightly this temperature. Right? And this is described as the greenhouse effect. So the sun is the source of energy that heats the earth. There is also, um, you know, the, uh, there's direct solar heating of the ground, but there is also indirect long wave radiation arising, arriving from radiation, thermal radiation as emitted by the ground. So the incoming solar radiation uh, heats the ground, and then the outgoing thermal radiation, um, you know, also uh, provides a warming effect. This long, long wave radiation is absorbed locally within the atmosphere and then is re-emitted upward and downward in directions so that further heats the ground. And so if you increase the, um, or you know, block the ability of the atmosphere to, to um, 
uh, transmit uh, or allow the transmission of this radiation, it's going to scatter around and absorb more um, and uh, have this effect. And this radiative in, in, in interaction is the greenhouse effect, which was first proposed in 1824. So the greenhouse effect is what we would call a theory, not a hypothesis, um, not a, really a law of nature, but a theory, just like the theory of evolution, the theory of relativity, um, the theory of DNA. You know, this is one of the fundamental understanding that um, we have about how the Earth system works. So it's not something that we can just dismiss or, or take for granted. It is well-founded scientific knowledge. Right. Well, what does that mean in the present day? Well, um, if we look at the, so that's the, the idea. Here is the, the um, greenhouse effect in a, in a cartoon. So incoming solar radiation, the radiation enters the Earth's atmosphere. It's absorbed and blocked. Sensible heat, uh, radiant, radiant, latent heat flux, evaporation. This is the work that's performed. And these numbers are approximate uh, uh, you know, relative proportions. So, um, you know, there's, this is the reabsorption, the readmission, and then this is the ultimate uh, 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 terrestrial radiation that we're using to space. Okay, so that is the greenhouse effect. And you've seen, I'm sure, uh, dozens of diagrams, and children produce these diagrams, um, but uh, what I've given you is a little bit more uh, detail on how this works in terms of the spectra of light and the spectra of, so of, of solar energy. Well, what's happened more recently? More recently, um, we've had a unprecedented run up in the concentrations of greenhouse gases, and specifically uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And what we're looking at here is the famous Keeling curve. And so Keeling was an oceanographer with Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography. And uh, starting in the late 1950s, uh, he developed a uh, methodology, a mass spectrometry, uh, capable of measuring, making very precise measurements of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And he realized that this measurement of CO2 in the atmosphere could potentially be important for understanding the Earth's system. And so uh, he thought about where could he uh, place an observatory that would be able to make these measurements um, uh, over a, a consistent basis. And he chose the um, uh, observatory in Mauna Loa uh, in, on the uh, big island of um, Hawaii, and this is uh, at about 4,000 meter altitude, and uh, you know it's it's uh, a suitable place because this is you know there are strong winds. It's away from the influence of cities and and other factors. Um, so what you're getting there is a sort of a well mixed picture of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere across the northern hemisphere. Okay, and so this is the Keeling curve. So starting in, you know, in the 1960 or so, the amount of CO2 in parts per million in the atmosphere has been increasing steadily. And this looks like a, a linear increase, but you can see that there's a sort of a, a, a curve to it. And this curve is in fact a, um, uh, Uh, you know, it's a nonlinear um, rate of increase. Uh, and, um, you, you know, the precision that, um, that uh, Keeling's measurements uh, allow him to make uh, can be seen here in this variation, um, this oscillation, uh, which is annual in scale um, that characterizes the, the sort of daily measurements of CO2 that are, that are made. You can see this at greater scale here if we start in 2015 and look at a five year record into the present day. So there's a steady increase uh, in the rate of um, um, uh, CO2, and that on an annual basis, it goes up and down. Right? And if this is um, 2015 uh, to 2016, so we'll assume this is um, January of 2015. Um, to um, 
uh, you know, January of, of 2016, we can see that there's an increase in CO2 and then there's a decrease in CO2. And then that increase in CO2 uh, corresponds to roughly the uh, winter months. And that decrease in CO2 corresponds to roughly um, the summer months. What would be driving that? Question for the class. So somebody tell me, why would we expect to see a annual um, variation in such a predictable way, winter to summer, in the content of CO2 in the atmosphere of Earth? It's due to um, the annual blooming uh, pattern of plants. So in the spring, when the plants bloom, they're absorbing more CO2. And then in the winter, when they die, there's, there's more CO2 in the atmosphere because they're not absorbing it. Exactly right. Thank you for, I, I, I expect that a lot of people already know this, but it's worth remembering because, um, you know, Senator Inhofe uh, looked at this record and said, well, um, uh, you know, this variability shows that we're, that we have a natural cycle uh, of CO2. And then if we wait long enough, the amount of CO2 will decrease. That's not the case. It's a misinterpretation of these data, and there's a much simpler, uh, much more uh, profound uh, 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 explanation. And so, you know, this annual variability rises on a um, uh, exponential rate of increase in CO2 over the atmosphere. Okay, so how much are we at? You know, right now, um, we have approximately uh, 415 413 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, 413 parts per million CO2. So it's present in a trace amount. Um, you know, you, you, you have a hard time um, weighing it or measuring it or accounting for it in any kind of visible way. Um, and Keeling's technology is able to resolve this, um, but nonetheless, it's a trace amount. So uh, how can this trace amount uh, of gas in the atmosphere be driving uh, changes in temperature, um, you know, which correspond to the, um, you know, the long-term average that we saw in the, um, in the graph that I showed you earlier, where there's a steady run up in temperature, where we're having the, you know, the hottest years on record are recurring at, on a regular basis. And this is a, you know, a, a point here. So, you know, how is this, how is this being done? Well, um, it turns out that uh, carbon dioxide is one of the control knobs on the planet, on the planetary um, uh, climate. And you know, control knobs are forcing factors that you know, can, like a control knob on a, a, a stereo, can increase or decrease the volume of um, the output of the system. So, um, Oops, I got this in the wrong order. So long-term uh, control knobs on million-year time scales, uh, volcanoes are the principal source of atmospheric CO2. And rock weathering is the principal sink. So volcanoes release CO2 into the atmosphere, and then that CO2 is absorbed as rocks are weathered. And um, you know the, uh, these two sources and sinks can operate quasi independently of each other. So the atmospheric uh, level of CO2 can fluctuate uh, over time, um, you know, without these things. If the atmospheric CO2 were to fall below its critical value, we could have conditions of snowball earth, or at low values, we could have a protracted period of glaciation. The short-term variation uh, in um, climate is the atmospheric CO2 fluctuating. Uh, you know, the, the Antarctic and Greenland ice cores show a fluctuation between 180 to 300 parts per million uh, over the past 650,000 years. So we've been fluctuating, you know, roughly, um, you know. Uh, at a scale of roughly 150 uh, parts per million. It's been going up and down over that range over the past 650 million years. So over the past 650 million years, the maximum concentration of CO2 that we've had in the atmosphere has been roughly 300 parts per million. And here we are uh, in 2020 with well over 400 parts per million and uh, no end in sight. So in other words, it's increasing. 
No, I shouldn't say no end in sight because I saw in the paper this morning that uh, the United States has had the lowest uh, greenhouse gas emissivity um, uh, in the, over the last three years due to the changes brought on by uh, the COVID um, uh, pandemic. So you know, it is possible for our, uh, our, our uh, system to come turned down. So the relative physical processes that turn um, the CO2 into a control knob on the thousand year time scale uh, involve both the biosphere, ocean chemistry, and a significant role uh, for Milankovitch variations in the Earth orbital parameters. Okay. All right, well, let's look at this control knob because this control knob comes up again and again. So here I'm going to play for you a little clip um, taken, uh, I guess this was 2018. And here's a hearing to examine the president's budget request for the Department of Energy for the fiscal year of 2018. And we're looking at former Senator Frank. Is the primary control knob for the temperature of the earth and for climate, you answered no. So if the climate is changing, and if you disagree that CO2 is the primary driver, what do you think is driving the change? Yes, sir. And, and I'll, I'll finish the rest of that uh, interview <clears throat> for the public that may, I, <clears throat> excuse me, that may have not gotten um, as much coverage as be saying that I did not think that CO2 was the primary knob uh, that changes it. Uh, I don't, um, I, I think there are some other uh, naturally occurring uh, events, uh, the warming and the cooling of our um, of, of our ocean waters and some you know other activities that occur. I also said in the next breath uh, that man's impact does in fact uh, have uh, an impact on on the climate. Uh, and the question is, what is going to be the economic impact for this country? Okay, so here you have a top official in our government uh, who is struggling to uh, provide an answer on, you know, what is the principal control knob or driver on climate change. And uh, instead of uh, acknowledging that CO2 is the primary controller, he looks at the secondary characteristic, the warming and the cooling of the oceans, as if this were somehow independent uh, of other forcing factors, as if the oceans could warm and cool in a, you know, without uh, being uh, receiving energy from the sun or changing the way in which the energy arrives and is, is um, absorbed or scattered you know, by the atmosphere and ocean. And so he's unclear on the concept. Well, you know, how can we understand better how this control knob works? And, um, you know, the following points are often asserted in the climate change debate. Um, that water vapor is the principal greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And as you saw when I showed the absorption spectra for different atmospheric gases, that is correct. Water is the principal greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Um, and about 98% of the natural um, greenhouse effect is due to water vapor and clouds. So most of the experience of warming will be due um, to the um, uh, effect that atmospheric uh, uh, water vapor has. And so, um, you know, it would be easy to say, well, you know, if, if it's all due to water vapor increasing or decreasing, then the presence of CO2, which contributes less than 2% of the greenhouse effect, that's not the primary control knob. In fact, the primary control knob is the um, variation in water vapor. Um, you know, given this, uh, it's possible, would be possible to argue that we don't need to be so concerned about CO2 in the atmosphere because really it's just all caused by the variation in, in water temperature. Now, remember what I said when we were talking about this, you know, water vapor uh, is a, uh, you know, is a very dynamic, the, the amount of water vapor, the amount of clouds in the atmosphere is an extremely dynamic factor, variable. It's changing, you know, on an hourly or you know, minute to minute basis as uh, um, water evaporates, uh, condenses, precipitates in the atmosphere. So uh, water vapor has a very, very short residence time in the atmosphere. CO2, on the other hand, uh, when a CO2 molecule enters into the, into the um, 
uh, atmosphere, it has a half-life in the atmosphere of tens of thousands of years. So whatever we put into the atmosphere now stays in the atmosphere or can be expected to stay in the atmosphere for a long period of time. Well, how does this affect how we should understand that? And how can we understand that process? Well, the way that we can understand it is by modeling. And modeling is something that um, also comes under a lot of criticism by um, uh, uh, people who are skeptical about climate change. And uh, however, uh, modeling is um, a modern technique. And you know there are problems with modeling and there are uncertainties with modeling. A lot of the uncertainties have to do with the resolution of, uh, of the model. You know, we have an earth system in which you know, the, the, you know, it's very complex and very variable across huge uh, uh, time and spatial scales. So how can we understand that through models? Well, um, I'm gonna show you a model experiment here that was conducted um, by the Goddard Institute of Space Studies. This is something, a, a study by Lysis and others, um, I think in 19, uh, 2010. And their basic findings are as follows, that water vapor accounts for about 50% of Earth's greenhouse effect, clouds contribute about 25%, and CO2 uh, contributes 20%. So the CO2 control knob, uh, you know, is able to um, turn up the temperature um, by about uh, one fifth of the total uh, response. And then there are other greenhouse gases, uh, ozone, uh, methane, which account for the remaining uh, five percent or so of, uh, of change in the atmosphere. Well, um, if we look at this. Um, we can see that uh, this is a factor of forcings and feedbacks. So um, water vapor, because it is such a dynamic variable in the atmosphere, responds quickly. Um, whereas CO2, because it is a very stable uh, variable in the atmosphere, uh, has a long-term effect. So as the forcing effect um, uh, is increased by CO2, the feedbacks, the, the response of um, the, the amount of uh, water vapor and clouds in the atmosphere increases. So this is a classic feedback effect where the, um, the amount of CO2 uh, is uh, producing a, a change in this, in this, um, this uh, more dynamic variable. So that's the conclusion uh, of the modeling experiment, which was done by Lysis and others uh, in 2010. What else did they see? They see that um, you know, they performed an experiment um, using a model that uh, resolved uh, the Earth's atmosphere in, in uh, two and two and a half degree um, uh, pixels. And so they, they took the whole of the planet and divided it into, into units of space uh, corresponding to roughly two degrees on the side. And they ran this um, ocean model. They assumed a mixed layer depth of 250 meters in the ocean. They zeroed out all non-condensing greenhouse gases and aerosols. And the physics of this model um, you know, can produce um, changes. And so these are the changes. So this is um, assuming that there's a um, uh, removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. So you can see that if we removed CO2 from the atmosphere altogether, um, that uh, the surface temperature would rapidly decrease uh, to uh, approximately uh, minus 20 degrees. So removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, addition of CO2 in the atmosphere has the effect of increasing the temperature. Removal of CO2 from the atmosphere has the, the potential of um, decreasing the temperature. So if we think back to those periods of um, uh, in Earth's history, when um, we, the whole planet was essentially frozen over, we might surmise that during those periods, there was very little carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in fact, if we look at the um, formation of uh, fossil fuels, fossil carbon, the formation of fossil carbon preceded these greenhouse, these uh, glacial periods, these snowball earth periods. And um, you know, so that uh, one of the reasons that the earth's uh, climate, and switch can go back to that, to this, hopefully I can do that, let's see.
Okay, sorry about that. It took me a second here. Um, so, um, you know, we can see here that this 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 period, um, you know, of glacial uh, uh, glacial periods, the snowball Earth periods, were preceded by times in which the um, you know there was massive uh, formation, massive sequestration of atmospheric carbon dioxide. So very high levels of uh, primary productivity on the planet, you know, in, fed in part by these warm periods, uh, which resulted in the removal of CO2 from the, uh, from the atmosphere to a very low level, and then the response of the Earth in essentially freezing over. So the global, the, the, um, the uh, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere has produced, you know, the, the reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere has produced these cold uh, periods. And we're coming out of a cold period now. And the reason that we're coming out in the, of this cold period now is because the CO2 or the carbon that was uh, sequestered in the form of fossil carbon energy um, uh, prior to these uh, uh, glacial periods uh, has been over the last hundred years or so removed from its uh, geographic, uh, geologic uh, resting place, burned and put back into the atmosphere in the form of CO2. Um, so, um, you know. So our cold period would have lasted longer and it, and it should have lasted longer, except we sped it up by digging out all the fossil fuels and, and burning them and putting carbon back in. And then exactly right. We should be in a period. So there was a, you know, a prior to, um, you know, over the last 10,000 years or so, we've been in a relative warming period. And we should be now leaving that warming period and entering into a relatively colder period, you know, according to this 1500 year um, a variation that's characterized um, the last time. But we didn't. Instead, we changed direction. Uh, we totally altered the, the direction of the climate, and we're now proceeding towards a um, period of um, you know, unprecedented warming. Well, not unprecedented. It's, we have had warmer periods in the past, but you got to go back like 30 million years to find um, you know, uh, corresponding warm periods in Earth's history. Go ahead. And then, sorry. And then with that, so are, is it also... We also have like positive feedback, right? Because as we're, since we're warming the atmosphere more than it's supposed to be, um, all the ice that should be lasting a while, that's all melting and releasing even more carbon, right? That's stored in it. Yeah, right. I mean, there's a bunch of feedback factors that are happening here. You know, one thing of the melting ice is the change in the albedo so that uh, ice reflects um, uh, solar energy. Um, but uh, dark you know, water absorbs solar energy. And so instead of being reflected back into space, the energy, you know, the light that hit, you know, which would have happened if, you know, if we had, uh, you know, ice sheets in the in the in the uh, in the Arctic, that ice has has has, has thawed, melted, and instead we have uh, uh, heat energy being absorbed by. So that's one feedback mechanism. Another feedback mechanism that's happening that's of great concern is, as you, as you suggested, that there's a melting of the permafrost, a melting of you know, what was the, you know, the cryosphere. Um, and with this melting, a lot of the gas, both CO2 and you know, even more concerning, uh, methane, which has been trapped in this, this frozen material, is also melting and being released. So there are multiple feedback um, mechanisms um, that tend to accelerate and amplify the, the, the changes that are being driven fundamentally by the increase in greenhouse gases. So let me go back to where we were in our slides here. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, the geologic evidence of glaciation that you know, supported snowball earth hypothesis and um, you know, the escape from the snowball earth is achievable if factors come along that release CO2 to the atmosphere. So once we're frozen, you know, how did we thaw out? Well, we thawed out because there were processes that, um, you know, allowed, uh, uh, you know, CO2 to, to reemerge, probably volcanism. So volcanism, you know, may have been accelerated during these periods of snowball earth, and that may have driven, um, you know, pulled us out of these, these snowball periods. But the point is that right now, um, you know, so this is the, uh, 
this is this is showing the um, um, uh, you know how Earth would go from a period of, of warming into a snowball period, and the opposite is what's happening now. Okay, um, so that is what I wanted to say about climate change, and I am going to ask you all, uh, as part of your final exam to make some cogent arguments. This is what I said on Tuesday, is that I think that you ought to come out of this exam as an advocate for um, you know, rational thinking about how we go forward and you know, how we understand the Earth system, you know, the biodiversity of the Earth system, and you know, more than anything else, the, the changes that are occurring because of climate forcing due to CO2 and other other factors. So I'm going to ask each of you um, to formulate arguments about climate change and about the real world effects of climate change and to present these arguments in verbal and oral ways uh, as part of your uh, final exam qualification um, for um, demonstrating that you have thought deeply about issues in environmental science and been able to um, impart what you've learned uh, to a wider uh, audience both of your friends, your, your parents, uh, and uh, citizens that you're gonna encounter um, when you go forward with your professional careers. Okay, that's what I had to say, but I welcome uh, any, any thoughts of, uh, I'll stop sharing the screen here, I can manage that. And um, we'll go ahead. Oh, I guess I had forgotten to share the screen. Um, yeah, I was going to say, uh, uh, and, but then you finished talking about whatever it was, and I was like, oh, were you meaning to share the screen? For that I forgot to share the screen. Yeah, I was going to show you, uh, let me let me go back, because I, I guess that was a little confusing. So I was going to show you, um, you know, these periods here, you know, so these are the frozen periods, all right? So this is when, you know, the Earth was a snowball Earth, okay? And prior to Earth becoming a snowball. We, wait, we still, we still can't see it. Uh, there, how's that? Can you see it? Yes, okay. All right, sorry. It's, I get confused about whether I'm sure <laughs> I was talking. So thanks for the feedback. It's a little hard um, to do this. All right, so here is one of, here are these glacial periods. And there was a particularly long lasting glacial period um, in, in, you know, in, this, in this time of year. Um, this also corresponds to you know, some of the uh, extinction events. Okay, so prior to that, if you look here, you know, there were warm temperatures, you know, this was Earth, you know, uh, and, you know, the whole of the planet from the North Pole to the South Pole was conducive to high levels of primary productivity, uh, removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, sequestration of that CO2 as fossil carbon, burial of that fossil carbon, um, and, you know, to such an extent that like the like the uh, models that Lysis and others performed, the Earth was plunged into one of these glacial periods. Okay, and so this carbon that was deposited in these in these periods, um, you know, is exactly the material that we are now removing uh, in, in the form of fossil fuels, coal and oil and methane, natural gas, uh, burning and releasing the carbon that had been sequestered in this, in this fossil energy back into the atmosphere and doing so not at a scale of you know, uh, geologic time, but in a human scale, time scale. So, you know, lifespan of human beings, you know, we've, we've you know, if you look at the, at the, the run up in CO2, fast forward to that. Let's see. So what the Keeling curve is showing us is that, you know, uh, you know, um, I was born in 1951. And so over my uh, lifespan, you know, the uh, amount of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, has increased by, you know, 100 parts per billion. You say unprecedented in, in, uh, in uh, you know, in documented at any rate in Earth history. Now, there may have been periods of, you know, massive uh, volcanism when there was a similar run up, but we don't know. We have no record, uh, no, uh, you know, firm record of that occurring. We infer that it might have happened at different times, but the increase um, in, in, you know, the amount, the rate at which we're adding CO2 to the, to the atmosphere uh, has no precedent in uh, Earth history that, that we can document. But 
it has an effect. And you can see that effect. Okay. So, so it basically, I mean, so the, the earth took, you know, millions of years to adapt to uh, an environment that was suitable for our, our species to come about and flourish. And then right. now in the blink of an eye, we're reversing that. We're changing and, the rules. We're moving the goalposts. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Yep, that's right. And, you know, and how are we doing that? You know, we've, in, in my lifespan, you know, we burned through, you know, at least 100 million, probably 200 million years worth of carbon sequestration in one lifespan. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, you know, the earth did its own process and we're, we're actually just re reversing everything it did to make things better. Well, better or worse, I mean, you know, the earth doesn't, you know, I don't think earth cares, but certainly well, yeah, better, I mean, better or worse I, for people. I guess this I guess just uh, just life was happening in a, in a way that that was helpful and we're, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting to think about. Yeah, it's amazing to think about. And we should think about it. And we should think about it not just at a personal level, but at, a, you know, among peers and friends, uh, you know, at a community level, at a you know, state and local level, um, and at a national and international level. And, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, if enough people, particularly young people who are armed with, with knowledge and scientific knowledge and energy, you know, personal energy, can go out and make these arguments and try to be willing to live by the consequences of these arguments and the, you know, the implications of these arguments, perhaps we can begin to reverse that. Um, I don't know, we'll see, time will tell. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so that brings me to the end of what I'm going to say as a, as a professor. We'll, you know, I'll be questioning and helping the, the presentations that uh, students will be giving in the, in the coming uh, class periods. Um, I, I enjoy this class. I enjoy the interaction. I realize we've had a sort of a special kind of set of circumstance with uh, COVID and this all being remote. Um, and, you know, I miss the interaction that we get in the classroom or I can see people responding. On the other hand, I, I really enjoyed, you know, the times that we've had together uh, when we've had, you know, conferences with, uh, with the teams and had a chance to, you know, to, um, you know, interact with students on a, on a more personal level, you know, really getting into the presentations and understandings that you've had. So I want to thank you. Uh, for being a good class, and I look forward to the presentations, and uh, um, there we are. Okay, any comments, thoughts? I guess not. All right. I hope I haven't totally blown you away um, with all this uh, climate stuff. Uh, you know, there's a lot of science here. Some of it is frankly beyond me. You know, uh, I could never put together a climate model like uh, Lysis and others have done. Um, but the thing is, you know, to, to, to learn these things, you know, you know, to understand, to recognize the science that lays at the, at the heart and the foundation uh, of this knowledge. And, you know, as I said on Tuesday, you know, one of the things that they say again and again that you hear climate skeptics say is that it's very difficult um, to understand, uh, you know, the contribution that human activities make to these changes. That's a hard thing to do. And as I said on Tuesday, yeah, it is hard, but that's what science and engineering does. That's what we do at our best is to do very difficult things. And it's hard, um, you know, to take a sample of ice that's 100,000 years old and bring it to the surface and grind it up and extract a tiny little bit of, uh, of uh, ancient air from that sample. And then literally to count the numbers of atoms in that air and from that infer, um, you know, what the temperature was when that air was deposited 100,000 years ago. Yeah, that's really hard, but that's what science does, hard things. All right. Well, goodbye. I'll see you um, on Tuesday. And uh, of course, we're available by email. Uh, Carrie and I, if you have questions about your presentation or whatever, and uh, I'll look forward to, to talking with you uh, next week. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs>